Hello? Good evening. <laughs> feel like that. The days have run together lately. How many of you uh, sometimes feel like you're not appreciated at home or at work? Huh? <laughs> like no, <laughs> nobody cares. Oh, she definitely does. Yes. <laughs> nobody cares what you've done for them. Your boss doesn't tell you thank you. You feel like nothing you do is good enough, right? Well, God's about to give you a blow to your ego. <laughs> Dear Lord, <laughs> I'm going to need some prayer tonight. Help me to be your humble servant. Take your word today and root it into the hearts of your people. Help us to understand your words and put them into action when we leave here today. Help us to grow to be more like you every day. In your name I pray. Amen. I'm a little scared now. <laughs> well, today's parable was spoken to the disciples. If you turn to Luke 17, 7. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet? And will, rather, and will ra not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward then you shall eat and drink. So what Jesus is saying here is a little bit strange to us because most of us don't have servants. But back then, everybody had, you know, not everybody, but the, the people, the landowners, would have servants that worked their field. Basically, they're slaves. Some of them are working towards their freedom as bond servants. Um, basically, what they would do is they, they would finish their morning job, which was taking care of the cattle, and then when they came in, part of their pay was basically to eat because they weren't paid money. Um, so to, to tell them, go ahead and take the rest of the day off. I don't need to eat today. You go ahead and, go, go, you go ahead and eat and enjoy yourself. That's, that's not something you would do. Um, basically, let's say, let's say your, your boss says, go ahead and take the rest of the day off, but I'm going to pay you anyway. You're probably not going to do that, right? It's not going to happen. <laughs> so, uh, continuing on in verse 9, then he goes on, continues with, uh, doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded of him? I trow not. So likewise ye, when you shall have done all those that which are commanded of you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. So Jesus is really getting his point across here. Do you say thank you to that servant? He's just doing his job. Let's put it this way. How often does your boss come to you and say thank you? Might happen every once in a while because we, you know, we're a little bit of a soft community, and it's they're going to come up to you and be like, uh, thank you for all that you do, because my boss told me I had to say that to you, right? <laughs> But we like to complain about that. We even talk about how we're going to leave that job because they don't appreciate us. And my next job, it's going to be so much better, right? Spoiler alert, at your next job, they're also going to expect you to do your job. <laughs> yeah. I can only imagine what was uh, happening when Jesus brought on these words. I doubt Jesus just sat down and started saying them as Luke would have us to believe here. My guess is... The disciples are talking about all the good things they've done. Maybe Peter was talking to Jesus and says, I was talking to this group over there, and they're really struggling with depression. I talked to them about your love and all about you, and they gave their lives over to you, and they're saved. And Jesus looks up at them and goes, hmm, okay. Peter's like, what's up, Lord? Didn't I do good? He's looking for validation. For a thank you. That's when Jesus wants to smack him around a little and humble him. Just a little bit, right? <laughs> All the work that was done was God. If someone was saved, it was God that saved them. Not Peter, not the disciples, not anybody on earth. God worked the field. God fertilized the ground so that the seed would fall on good soil. You may have tossed that seed, but that was just your job. God changed the heart, and Jesus did the saving. 
But that's today's world. People constantly are under, underappreciated. I've heard people get upset because they opened the door for somebody and they didn't get a thank you. Did you really just open the door so that you would get a thank you? I mean, what was the point of opening it? And if that bothers you so much, how miserable must you be? How long do you go about your day for the rest of the day and be like, I opened this door for this person and they didn't say thank you. Can you believe that? Can you believe it? Like this grand gesture, I, I went all out of my way to open the door and they walked right through without having to touch the handle and said no, and no thank you at all. And that's your biggest problem that day. <laughs> I don't want to be around that person, <laughs> I'll tell you what. But there's a very important key here. Jesus calls it our duty. We don't need recognition for doing our job. We don't need the thank you for serving our Lord. We're supposed to do it. If you don't do your job, you get fired. To the servants, keeping your job meant you get to live there. You get to be clothed. You get to eat. In some instances, like I said, you might be working for your freedom. That is your recognition. You don't need more. You don't need a thank you. You get to keep your job. Your boss doesn't have to say thank you for you doing what you're supposed to do. If he didn't think you were worth it, he's going to stop paying you. God does this with Israel. When they stopped producing for him, they removed him. They lost their job. I don't even want to think about what that feels like. Jesus is telling his disciples that they are to do God's work and expect nothing in return. Not only that, but they are to feel unworthy to even do God's work. We are unprofitable servants. Unprofitable. We should not expect God to reward us for what we have done. He's already done that. In fact, he's rewarded us so much, we can never actually be paid what he's already given us. But we still think, I gave to my church. God's gonna be, God needs to bless me with money now. I helped that old lady cross the seat, the street. Excuse me. <laughs> maybe, I, maybe, maybe we helped her cross the seat. I don't know. <laughs> but now I'm going to have good karma. Good things are going to happen to me because I helped this lady cross the seat, the street. I keep saying seat. What's going on? <laughs> but our works are nothing compared to what God has already done for us. They're as filthy rags. The idea that we should be rewarded is why they're filthy rags. If we think we should be rewarded, then we did them for ourselves. We didn't do them for God. We did them for us. When you were a kid and you went out and you found a dandelion to give your mom or a pretty rock or something, I realized as I was looking this up that I've never seen a dandelion since we've been here. Have you? No? Do dandelions exist here? Okay. I, I just checked. I have not, I've not seen one since we've been here, but they grew everywhere in my old neighborhood. But as a kid, what we did, we, used to, we would go pick those and give them to our mom as flowers. It's a weed. And that's what God wants us to be to him. We didn't give it to, I didn't give it to my mom because she's going to take me to get ice cream. I wanted my mom to feel loved. I wanted her to be happy. That's what God wants from us. He wants us to give to him because we love him, because we want him to feel our love. It doesn't mean a whole lot. That weed to my mom, she didn't care about it, but I guarantee you she loved it. She, she knew I was thinking about her, and that's what God's looking for. We're a self-centered people. And because of that, we're miserable Christians. <laughs> Thanks, Albert. <laughs> Being a Christian means to be Christ-like. How many of us can look at our lives and truly say, yeah, I'm Christ-like? <laughs> Not me. I know my own faults. So does my wife. I know my own shortcomings. I have to live with myself and watch the things I do. I can't even think about something without me knowing about it. <laughs> but we call ourselves Christians. We do it confidently because most of the time, none of you know our shortcomings. Sometimes to humble us, God will show those. And uh, nothing I can think of would be more humbling than all of my faults being spread out in front of people. People who think you're perfect, that all of a sudden find out you're not so perfect. My kids used to think I was awesome. <laughs> Thought I could do no wrong, right? <laughs> Whatever I said was their Bible. I knew everything. Then they grew up. They watched me screw up. They watched me sin. They watched me do things I told them not to do. 
They saw the bad things I did, and now they make fun of me all the time, <laughs> usually to my wife. And then she joins in because she knows about them all too. I can't even argue with the things they say because they're true. I can't pretend to be better than I am to them. In fact, they're probably shocked that a church lets me speak. <laughs> I'm no one to tell you what you're doing wrong. And they're right. I am no one. I'm not good enough. The good news is I don't have to be. Jesus advanced my paycheck, gave me a huge payday loan. I get to spend eternity in heaven no matter what. I already screwed up so much, and even though he knows I'm going to screw up a lot more, he overpaid me so much that even if I work for him 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the rest of my life, I'm never going to be able to pay him back. My ticket to heaven's already been punched. My departure date says TBD. The destination says deluxe apartment in the sky. <laughs> but our nature is to think, if there's no more reward for doing more, if I get no thank you for serving him, why should I? That's our self-centered attitude. That's, the, that's what we're born into, a sin nature that says to look out for number one and number one only. Maybe you expand to your family as you, as you get a little older. But there's probably a few family members you're okay with letting struggle too, right? If they treat you a little bit bad, you're like, mm, I hope God humbles you just a little bit. <laughs> we're all about doing what helps us and rarely about helping others unless it actually benefits us in some way. If we do something for someone else and we need recognition for it or a reward, we didn't do it for them. If we give money to the homeless but we got a guy behind us recording it for TikTok, it's not for us, or not for them. It was for us. In Matthew 6, 3, Jesus says to give in secret. Do not even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. He means don't even give yourself credit for it. Do it in love. Jesus tells his disciples that they are to do God's work and not look for reward. Don't expect a thank you. And that's because, like I said, it's God doing it, not them. God is doing it through them. They didn't do anything but obey his commands. God did all the work, so God deserves all the praise. If you want the praise, then you're asking for what's rightfully God's. With all he's done, why do you want more? God wants us to be God-centered, not self-centered. And that's where true joy comes. It's a reward beyond anything physical you can get in this world. And it's no coincidence that continuing in the next verse 11, Jesus goes in, or actually they, they are uh, traveling to Jerusalem. And as he went to Jerusalem, he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met there they met ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. So immediately after, Jesus talks about not, receive, not getting a thank you. They go on this, this uh, trap, or this, uh, I don't know, journey. There we go. That's the word I'm looking for. Thanks. I didn't write it down, so that was my problem. <laughs> but um, as they're going there, they find ten lepers. So lepers are, are not allowed to be a part of the community, kind of like COVID patients now, right? <laughs> leprosy had no cure it was a death sentence but it was a slow isolating hopeless death they had to leave everyone they knew their families le were left behind then they just had to spend their whole t their, their entire lives out of town away from everybody and on top of that when anybody did come close they had to throw their hands in the air and, and scream I'm unclean stay clear it's humiliating I'm not sure if, you, if you're like me, but that sounds pretty awful. First, you're given a death sentence. Then they tell you you can no longer be around anyone that you're, any of your loved ones anymore for the rest of your life. You have to be isolated outside the city, and your only companions are people who also have that same fate as you. It's a depressing life where the only thing you're looking forward to is watching the people around you die of the same thing you're about to die of. In verse 13, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. 
So all 10 of them had faith that Jesus would heal them. All 10 of them. Jesus shows up, and they already know we're saved. If they didn't have faith that he could heal them, they wouldn't have asked him to do it. In verse 14, he tells them, go show yourself to the priest. But they have not been healed yet. In those days, if you had leprosy, if you were going to go back and to, or if you were thought to have leprosy, because they, you, know, you didn't get healed of this, the only way you could return to the community was to go back to the priest and uh, have him clear you, get your negative COVID test so you could return home, right? So they all went. And as they went, they were cleansed. They weren't, they weren't cleansed before they went. In my mind, I'm thinking, I still have leprosy. I'm not allowed back there, and you want me to go. But they didn't question it. They just went. And they knew that because he said that, that they were about to be healed. Their faith allowed them to be healed as they obeyed Jesus. But there is a key character flaw we're about to hear about. In verse 15, And in one of them, or one of them, he saw that he was healed, turned back, and with a loud voice glorified God. He fell down on his face at his, and at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering, saying, said, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made you whole. So what happened? They're all healed, but only one of them even returns to give thanks to God. So don't expect a thank you, but that's because... You, you didn't do it. God did. Now, God does expect to thank you. It's a God-centered life here. That was a life-changing healing. From hopeless isolation to, to death uh, and, and, and no sickness and a restored life. How could you not save the person who did that for you? See, isolation to me is the worst thing that can happen to a person. And if you ask my wife's grandpa, he'd tell you the same. He and his, 67, his wife of 67 years, both 88 years old, got COVID at the same time. She also had a heart condition that she was not expected to survive. Um, she did not survive COVID after that, but he did. But during that time frame of 42 days, of, 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 he, had, he, was allowed, he had to be alone. When she died, they didn't even tell him. His family was not allowed to visit him. Nobody was allowed to go in to talk to him. But for 42 days, he's completely alone. I know that because every time I see him, he says that. He tells me that story every time I see him. It's probably the worst thing he ever went through. And he has Stephanie as a granddaughter. <laughs> he was sick, alone. <laughs> see, I had to lighten it up just a little, right? And lo just lost the love of his life. And the, what he talks about is the 42 days he spent alone. And with leprosy, you not only have that, but you, uh, you're in a hopeless situation you know you're going to die from. And then suddenly, you don't. But you don't return to Jesus to say thank you. That's because the second they got their healing from God, they immediately went back to that self-centered life. They wanted to get back home to their family. They, w they couldn't wait to get what they were just given. And I, I understand that, but that's not what we're, what we're being asked to do. So, their eyes were, get, were on getting back home, restoring their families, but they forgot the one that gave them the gift, except for that one. We do it all the time. God, please help me find a way through this valley. And then we get up on the mountain, and we forget we were ever in a valley. And then we look down in that valley, and we some, see something fun going on. We start walking right back down, like we don't even know what that valley was like. We're self-centered. This one man who was a Samaritan, which is the people the Jews despised, he was the only one with a God-centered mindset out of those ten. He was truly grateful to God, fell down praising him. He realized he was not worthy of the healing. He did nothing to deserve it, but God healed him anyway. Jesus is showing us that while we are not supposed to expect anything in return when we do God's work, God deserves all the praise for everything he does in our lives and for anything he does through, through you. We didn't do it, he did. He deserves the glory. We are the servant. He is the master. That's God-centered. In verse 19, Jesus says, Your faith made you whole. I can only speculate on the fate of all ten of these men. 
But I do believe that they all tend to go to heaven. They have faith. They believe in Jesus. They believed he would heal them. We don't hear about them after this, but before they were physically healed, they went. They obeyed. They did exactly what was asked of them. But And may, may, maybe in, in the future, they, they eventually thanked God for it in private. We don't know that for sure. But when they follow his, his commands without question, even Moses questions God when he thinks his commands don't make any sense. Jesus says in John 10.10, 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. So it's God's plan that we have a happy life here, abundant life. Abundant is different from eternal. The abundance is here on earth. Our problem is that we think a happy life means we need to be rich and get everything we want. And technically it does mean we'll get everything we want if you stop wanting more. When Jesus says in Luke 17, 19, thy faith hath made you whole, I believe he's telling that Samaritan that he recognizes his God-centered uh, mentality. And he's telling him that he's going to have life more abundantly. The others myth- missed out on that second part. They were cleansed, but not whole. They got their life back, but not abundant life. The Samaritan came back and got to experience who Jesus is. I believe he went home, had a full relationship with God. He most likely experienced near constant joy the rest of his life with a God-centered mindset. The glory belongs to God. We get none. We need to adopt a God-centered mindset. Quit thinking about what's in it for you. Think about what's in it for the lost. What's in it if they're not saved? Think about what God wants us to do for each and every person, what he wants to do for each and every person on this planet, if they would only allow it. The world's an ugly place. We need to stop acting like we're a part of it. We're in it, but not of it. That means we need to behave differently. We need to do what God wants us to do and only do it because he wants it. We don't need to know why, don't need to know how. All we need to know is what he's asking of us. Dear Lord, I thank you for the chance again to serve you tonight. Thank you for these words and what they mean to our lives. Thank you for who you are and what you've already done and everything you're going to do. We know that you deserve all the praise and the glory, and we apologize for wanting some of that for ourselves. We ask your help to do the, your will, your way, and expect nothing in return, and instead turn that glory straight over to you. In Jesus' name, amen.